got the hummingbirds coming in now. They're uh, feeding on all our feeders and uh, just bought a, a new one for Seppi's window and they've discovered that already. And there's one that's perching on my one and just stays there. And it's now said, okay, this is mine. Any other hummingbird that comes in here, get out. Uh, I'm going to protect it. And it makes all these weird sounds and then fights and sits back up on the perch, stops any other hummingbird from taking any nectar. <laughs> so they're real characters, these things, and uh, we all enjoy them. We all, all have uh, great enjoyment in watching these things. They're, they're wonderful creatures, aren't they? The sound they make, and they're so tiny. Um, this particular season, I've said to Sepia, I'm going to try and make uh, friends with them by having some feeders on my hand and see if I can get them to land on my hand and feed off my hand. That's my, one of my little objectives this summer. <laughs> Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for our time here and to the scriptures that are present with us, that they've been preserved and we can trust them and they speak to us. We thank Thee in Christ's name. Amen. Right, well, um, we're looking at the study of the book of Hebrews and it's been a great study so far. And um, uh, as I go through this, uh, I'm reminded of all the connections that you find in here. Um, we have this book that we're using as a commentary by Welsh, and it's a, it's a great book, and it's basically a summary of the uh, writings that uh, Welsh put into the Brian Expositor over the space of about 15 years. And so they were put together, and, and we've got access to them. And when you look at the book of Hebrews, in chapter number 1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. If you look at the, the way in which this is structured, it's, it's really an, a neat thing because it's a big reminder of the distinction between what has come to us in this age and what has come in the past. Um, if I just come over here and just look at the, the way in which this is written, God, so the English translates, puts the word God first, but you'll notice that what comes first in the Greek text is these three adverbs, many parts, many ways, and time past, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. That's the order in which it comes to us in the Greek text. Many parts, many ways in time past. And this is a big contrast with what we find for us. You know, because if you look at how things have been ordered, you have the book of Acts and you have the end of the book of Acts. And then at some time after this, uh, the mystery was revealed given to Paul, the prisoner, and I write it this way, reminding you, of course, Orem, gold, that when you, you find this, it really is something that opens the scriptures to you. And when you see how the revelation came to Paul, and then he in turn, of course, taught his fellow prisoners and fellow workers, and they in turn would would bring it out to the larger community, you find that it's very different to the in many parts and in many ways in time past, God spoke to the fathers of Israel by the prophets. Very different situation. Very different situation than what we f find, for example, in Colossians. Let's just go across to Colossians. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. So, if you go across to Colossians chapter number 1, you'll find some things that remind us of the Hebrews and some very diverse things. Like, for example, in Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's a clear connection with Hebrews because the writer of Hebrews brings out the same message there about salvation through his blood and putting it in context with the sacrifice that the Hebrews were so familiar with. And then it goes on. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now notice how it says, firstborn of 
every creature, and then it says, for by him were all things created. So he explains this word here, firstborn of every creature, the, the expression, because for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all three things were created by him and for him. So he's the firstborn in the sense that if you look at a family, the firstborn in those days was the chief inheritor. Right? The firstborn. They were the chief inheritor. And so Jesus Christ is the chief inheritor for by him were all things created. But you'll notice that Paul, the prisoner, is very careful to say visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities of powers, all things were created by him and for him. Because you see, what happens here is that Paul shows you this great place of the firstborn, Jesus Christ, that yes, he is the inheritor of all things. Not only those things that relate to, in some specific sense, to Israel and the promises that in many parts and in many ways, in time past, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Yeah, those are great things. But what Paul is going to bring out here is there's so much more that he, as the firstborn, the chief inheritor, is inheriting. And it relates to our inheritance. Look what it goes on to say in verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Oh man, they're held together. Again, another connection with Hebrews. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Now look at it. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Again, he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the first one who came up from the dead with eternal life. You might say, but what, didn't other people come up from the dead? Yeah, not with immortality. There were people in the Old Testament times who would come up from the grave. But there's no immortality for them. They would have to die again. We find mention made in the New Testament as well. But they would have to die again. Lazarus was brought up. But he would have to die again. He did not have immortality. Only Christ hath immortality. And he is the firstborn from the dead in that sense. And it goes on and he says there, this in verse uh, 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Now Paul because he was given this brand new revelation, he's got to fill up the sufferings of Christ, which went on before. And what does he do? Verse 25, I am made a minister according to the, look at this word, dispensation of God. This dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fill up the word of God. Man, without getting to know this, my friends, you have an incomplete understanding of the Bible because this fills it to the full. You say, well, what are you talking about, Wayne? I've never heard about this before. Okay, it's like me too, right? When I first was saved, I was in a church which, which would teach and say, oh, okay, and so uh, let's look at this next verse here in verse uh, 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son... People would say, well, we're, speak, we're living in those last days. Why? Because they read it in Hebrews 1, 2. This was addressed to people, Hebrews, that were living in the last days. And they were the ones who had been given prophets in the old days, but now hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, in Son. What we have over here, my friends, is something really quite remarkable. Over here in the book of Acts, you have the book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, there is this opportunity being given where Jesus can return. Jesus can return. He can return because there is a condition being placed during this time. 
of repentance. If Israel would repent, Jesus would return. But my friends, when we come over here, what we've got is quite a different thing. Quite a new thing has happened where Israel said no to God and God said, okay, but I've got a plan and purpose that you need to read about, you need to understand, which relates to the mystery given to Paul the prisoner. So over here in, in Colossians chapter 1, it says this, in verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is, manif is made manifest to his saints. Wait a minute, just consider that verse. Just consider that verse. Come over here. In many parts and in many ways, in time past, God spake to the fathers by the prophets. Wait a minute. The mystery hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. Oh, hold the phone then, friends. So this message here is based upon things that were made known to the prophets and to the fathers by the prophets. Okay, so the prophets, of course, they, they teach themselves through the inspiration of God. And here, this is something different. The mystery, it was hid from ages, but given to Paul the prisoner, and we learn it. Very distinct thing. Very distinct thing. And it says here, hath in these last days, the last days were running. The last days were running through the book of Acts. That's the last days. But my friends, last days always has a context. There's the last days of the book of Acts. There's going to be a last days of this age. Last days just refers to the days of the age, right? And what age we're talking about. Okay, as we go on through, it says, hath in these last days spoken us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the ages. He made the ages. Look at this. He made the ages. Cool, man. So this is a very cool thing that you find in the book of Hebrews. Um, and you'll notice the way it said, it said, in son. You see, he spoke before by the prophets. Now he's speaking in a very special way, in son, as a theophany. A theophany where God speaks in the person of the Son. A very distinct thing. Okay, cool. And I'll just, these are some of the things we talked about before. And I'm going to quickly move on because we've talked about this before. Okay, um, so here we're talking about this, uh, you know, by the prophets in the last days. See here, eschaton. You've, you've probably heard of the word eschatology. The study of the last things. In these last days he spoke. And we will not try and take these last days here and then try and bring them into our age. We're not going to do that. We're going to realize that God has spoken by Paul to us in this day on, on the basis that Israel said no to God. God said, okay, you don't want me. Fair enough. And I'm going to speak to the Gentiles and I've got a new message. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to just move on rather than keep going on the same thing we've done before. So let's just move on a little bit here. Now, <clears throat> now we've got to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Let's have a look at this together. And the, the most amazing thing that I think uh, is found in this. And it says this in Hebrews 1, 3. Who being, who being... See, who being, and then the King James says brightness, a palgasma. This is the brightness of his glory. Okay? There is a brightness of God. God, you cannot approach. His light and his being is such that we as mortals cannot approach unto. And the Lord Jesus Christ had this brightness. And it says here, um, of his glory, and the express image of his person. Now, in the Greek text, it says, and character, tes hypostasios altu, means 
this is, you can see the word character in here, and then this is the substance, his sub. So what this is saying is that there is this mark, right? The mark that's placed. And then into that mark goes the substance of God. Who is Jesus? He is the image of God. But in a very special way, he's the image of God in the sense that he is this express image of God's substance. Now, you might say, well, why do people, why do people want to make images of God? You notice that? I mean, if you go through all of the pagan religions and you go through all of the different religions around the world, you'll see these images of God, the images of God. What are they trying to do? That's their way of trying to make God more real to them, right? And they're going to bow down before this image. You know what's so wrong about that? What's so wrong about that is God has already appointed the image of God, who is Jesus. Right? That's what's so wrong with that. You might say, but that's a, it's a reasonable thing, isn't it? It's just a help in worship. You know, It's just a help in worship. No, it's not a help in worship, because what you're doing is you're looking at the, the, the uh, image of man's hands, his creative being. His creative ability trying to put into some man-made object of art something that represents God when that job has already been taken by the express image of God's person. You see the point? It's a, it's a, really, it's a really neat point. Who being the brightness of his glory. Okay, we talked about that last time. And now the next one. And the express image of his person. And then what I'm trying to show you to you are these Greek words. Character, that's the image. Tes hupastasios altu. That's of his substance. You see? So when you're coming to Jesus Christ, you're not just coming to a prophet. You know, there are some great prophets, but they're all got feet of clay. They all had problems because they had a sin nature and they were fallen. They needed a savior. Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. That is his substance. His substance was put into this image. God's substance put in the person of Jesus Christ. Very amazing, amazing thing. And so I've got these words here, who being the brightness of his glory, we've, we've looked at that. And I want you to see the structure, okay? Because coming to Jesus, you're coming to this brightness. And you're able to do such because he is the image, the express image of his person. The son, better than the prophets, that's this A part. And then you come down here to Hebrews 1, 4, 5. The son, better than the angels. Better than the prophets, better than the angels. Beautiful structure here, right? We have come to recognize the beauty of God's word and the structure that's there. But notice this. The son, the son, better than the prophets, better than the angels. And when you look at this, just have a look at it in, in the scriptures, Hebrews 1, uh, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Notice it's a quoting this passage, which ultimately comes to the book of Psalms. And I've put that up here just so you can read it, Psalm 2, 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. This day have I begotten thee. In the context here of resurrection, the word begotten then can take on different meanings depending on the context. He is begotten in the sense that he gained this special resurrection and with it this wonderful glory. Have a look at just a couple of passages. This is in... Uh, Hebrews in chapter 5 and verse 5. Uh, so you can see this with me. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Today have I begotten thee. See, we want to always think of begotten in terms of when uh, he was put into the womb of Mary. But in many cases, this begotten relates to the resurrection. The resurrection. Uh, if you run another passage with me, this is a Hebrews 11, verse 12. 
Hebrews 11, verse 12, it says this, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the skies in multitude, and as the sand which is by the sea shore, innumerable, in, innumerable. In verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, uh, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and that he was not afraid of the king's commandment. Again, going on with this, this great special place that uh, birth can bring. So in Jesus, you find, yeah, he, he is the son. He is the son, certainly, by birth. He took on flesh. You find that. But he is declared to be the son by resurrection. Now, here's something I've been studying for a long time, right? I've been looking at this for a long time. When you talk about being born again, being born again, you know that expression really only comes out clearly in one place in the scriptures. And we will look at that. Let's see if I can find it for you. Here it is here. This is in 1 Peter 1.23. Look at this. Being born again. Now, when it says being born again, Anna, that's the again part, and then the rest of this comes from ginomai, which is being, means to become. And then the last part of this relates to the fact that this is a, a, a passive participle. So here it means, it's perfect tense, what does perfect tense mean? A perfect tense means something has been done in the past and completed. And the effects of that keep going. Right? Something was done in the past, it was completed, and the effects of that keep going. That's the perfect tense. And it's passive because it wasn't done by the speaker, it was done by God in this case. Being born again, look how it goes. Not of corruptible seed, not out of seed, perishable seed, but imperishable. Notice it's got that little alpha on the front. That's called an alpha privative. It, it negates it. Seed that does not perish. Through the living word of God, which remains unto the age. Okay. Well, this is kind of cool. So it says here, there are people, Peter was saying, there are people who... We're born again. Okay, now look at this. If you look at John's Gospel, you'll find it talks about a new birth, which is from above. From above. He says, you must be born again. You must be born again. And then he talks about how the Spirit moves, just like the wind. And it takes you back to Ezekiel, which has the context of the resurrection, Israel's res resurrection. And he's saying you must be born again. Now we know from this passage here, where it says, having been born again, that's, he's talking to people who have literally experienced this, having been born again. So what we must get, I think, is this, that by faith, you trust on him who is going to raise you from the dead. You gain this beginnings of the new birth. And you experience it in the future through the resurrection. So I've got this picture up here of the, you know, this nice fancy faith. And then I've got the, the empty tomb showing you the resurrection that is to come. And we, we think of our loved ones. And this is the great thing, isn't it? There is tremendous sadness about the end of life. Don't try and pretend that death is nice. It's not nice. But one thing we can say is, through faith, we know now about the promise of a new birth coming in the form of resurrection. We experience now the Spirit coming to us and bearing witness with us that we are the children of God. And we know that in the future, because He's a God who honors his promises that we are going to come up from the grave. And our loved ones who have also come to know Jesus as Savior, they will come up 
And it's a fantastic thing for Gene, isn't it? When we think of Gene and we remember being a part of us here and one day she's going to come up with flesh like a babe, man. Can you imagine that? That's going to be a beautiful sight. Christianity, biblical Christianity, there's just no comparison to it. There is no comparison. All you've got in the religions of this world are other images graven with the art of man. But with Jesus, he is the express image of God's person, his substance. And that's what gives us confidence. In fact, that word, hypostasis, it's translated as confidence. It's translated that way because that's our confidence. Jesus, he is the express image of his substance. And therefore we have this confidence that one day we too will come up. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, I think. Wonderful thing. And so I'm pointing out here that, you know, in Colossians where it talks about the firstborn of every creature, the firstborn from the dead, some great connections to the fact that he is the chief inheritor. And because he is the chief inheritor, we can come to him today to understand our place in God's massive purposes. He has ma massive purposes. Do not think that you're going to understand all of God's purposes simply by reading the Old Testament and the passage of the New Testament related to Israel. You're not going to understand it because there are some hidden purposes that God has revealed to Paul the prisoner. And that's what we're excited about. Very excited about. And you find this in John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Notice it's said to be the Word. He's said to be the Word. And when the Word took on flesh, He becomes Son. He becomes Son also in the fact that He came up from the dead. Both things are true. And, and we can see that in our, in our teachings uh, as related to our own uh, uh, birth as well. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Everything that was made came through Jesus Christ as the Word. God spoke. That's the Word. He brought everything into being through His Word. And this one is a passage I showed you before. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, it means amen, amen. It's uh, truly true. I say unto you, Before Abraham came into being, I am. Whammo. He's always there. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty. It's a, it's a great thing. And we've talked about some of these things before. Um, so here it is here. This is the expression that we're looking at and the character of his substance, the character of his substance. Uh, there are plenty of idols. People try to make uh, images, and, and uh, Paul addresses this, showing that the image of God is Jesus. And it's a, it's a strong teaching. In Acts 17, 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, look at this, graven by art and man's device. That's the distinction, right, that you find in Hebrews. Hebrews 1.3. Because what we have in Hebrews 1.3 is the express image of his person. The substance of God was put into this image. These things are just graven by the art uh, and man's device. Now, I'm showing you in Hebrews three places where you find substance mentioned. We've just read in Hebrews 1, 3, but look in Hebrews 3, 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's the substance, steadfast unto the end, right? For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's the substance. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the substance 
faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the real part, the real part, people think, oh, it's just faith. It's just faith. No, faith is grounded upon the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, I'll finish here for today. But, uh, you know, th this book of Hebrews turns out to be just an amazing thing to me uh, as I go through it and consider the, the depths of it. So in Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of, a gl of his glory and the express image of his person. What is the point of my lesson for you today? When it says express image of his person, that points Jesus Christ off from all other images you want to put out there. All other religions that are going to try and use images to replace Jesus. Jesus is the express image of his person. That is the substance of God was put into Jesus who is the Son. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today, for all that we've learned. And we pray now, Lord, for the family of Jean, Lord, and we think of their uh, mourning and the separation that we realize. But we thank Thee for the resurrection that is to come when we shall unite again with great smiles and laughter and great joy there is to come. And we know that because Jesus is the resurrection and the life and he is the express image of Christ's person. He is the, of God's person. He is the one who is the uh, firstborn from the dead. And, and because of that, we know that we can come up also. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.